go. Can? Yeah. Right, okay. Hello everyone. Welcome to the session on Go. So how many of you are familiar with what GoLang is? I don't know. Just heard of it. Just heard of it. Just oh, heard right. it. Nice. Yeah, I guess this presentation then like perfectly suits you guys. This is just a basic introduction. There will be like very minimal code, but nothing scary. So I'll just go through like a give you a higher level introduction what this is all about. And we got Audrey up next. She will be presenting some of her own experiences and some of the cool stuff she built with Go. Actually, we have some trouble with Wi-Fi. We'll figure out something. So yeah, after me, Audrey will be presenting some of the actual real world implementations of this language. So let me start. Yeah, I'm Lakshana Pereira. Uh, my Twitter handle is LAKTK. And I work for this company called Nitrous.io. So Nitrous is, let me like give a brief introduction about Nitrous as well, since I guess most of you guys are new to programming, you might find this useful. Because Nitrous is a browser-based coding environment. And yeah, you can start programming on Nitrous itself. So if you haven't heard of it before, like go check it out, Nitrous.io. Okay, so what's Golang? In simple terms, like if you put in like programming terms, it's like compiled, concurrent, garbage collected, and statically typed language. It's quite a small pool of words, but how many languages, like which languages are like you're familiar? How many of you know about Java? Okay, so Java is more like a compiled language. And how many of you know about Ruby? Okay, so Ruby you can imagine it as a dynamic language, which is like the opposite of like a compiled statically typed language. So it's like dynamic and it's, uh, it's just like an interpreter which it like just runs uh, without like having to compile the program. So Go is like opposite of Ruby and it's kind of in the similar domain as C and Java, but it has its own garbage collection and it has built-in concurrency, which is like you can run multiple stuff together, to put it in like real interface ways. So that's the general overview of the language, but if you go down further down, like you hear these days like all these new crazy languages like Ruby and even Python, and there's this all these new languages called Scala, Rust. These languages like have a lot of magic, like it's pretty easy to get up and running. But Go is like totally opposite of this. It has no magic in it. So it's like, like if you start with this, like you might wonder why I should learn Go. Because it has no magic. Like it's not this cool hipster language, like all these cool things, like you know JavaScript, no JS kind of like uh, whole way we have these days, like everyone building like from interpreters to like, full machines with like JavaScript only. And it's totally opposite of that. It has no magic in it. It's like pretty, damn verbose language, but it can be highly productive or extremely boring. It's like either the same or either the same. So it depends on your personality. So <laughs> it it may be like highly productive language, but if you grasp it correctly and if it suits with your philosophies of like learning the program, uh, I think we'll get to that a little bit later with Audrey because she has a cool story to share about this, these two extremes. <laughs> so yeah, it can be like that. So a little bit of a history of Golang. It started as a Google project. So in 2007, Google set up this secret project. They hired these two guys, Ken Thompson and Rob Pye. These were the guys who created like C and Unix back in the day, like in 1970s. So they were like the pioneers of like computer programming and whole computing architecture we have today. So Google hired them and they gave them some funding to start, uh, start with a new programming language. So this is like a ground up, like rewrite. Oh, I mean, it's not rewrite, it's like a from the scratch language. So they brought their experiences from C and Unix days and applied it to modern computer requirements and they came up with this language. So in 2009, the first version was released. And you can see this cool little mascot, right? This, this is called the Gopher, like Go Gopher. It's the official mascot of the programming language, yeah. So like everywhere you see this, you know it's related to some programming language. It's not like, like a fancy web app or anything, it's just a programming language. <laughs> okay, so who uses Go these days? So it's quite popular. Though it was released in 2009, now like 
companies like Facebook, Dropbox, PayPal, all these high-end tech companies, they actually use Go for their internal projects plus stuff you, you might use day to day. And a lot of open source projects as well, like Docker, Chorus, and like Conceal. I don't know whether you guys have heard of these projects, but yeah, these are like some of the new open source projects and they are actually using Go. And for the better part, like hobbies like us, right? Most of us like started with Go before we had these in our workplaces or anything, like right? just for the fun of this new language. And there are a lot of hobbies like us who use Go and who quite enjoy using Go because if you look at a country like Singapore, here the adoption is not that great at this moment because still most companies rely on Java or else like some of them use Ruby and stuff. But like, yeah, most companies do switch to Go when they discover the bottlenecks of this language. And Nitros is one of them, so we went through this whole Ruby or JS process. And then we figured out like certain things sucks in these languages and it didn't it not sucks, but it didn't really suit our needs. So we had to switch to Go. And we were using Go for like our hobby projects before that and now like we use Go for our day to day work plus hobbies as well. So it's like kind of a good language that balances your hobbies plus actual work. So if you want to get started, how do you get started? So you just download and install Go on your machine. Or else, as I said earlier, you can use Nitrous IO because we provide a Go box. So if you sign up for Nitrous and select a stack, you can select Go and start coding on your browser itself. So once you have your environment set up, I'm not going to go through the environment of like setting up all this stuff because it's quite boring. You guys can do it on your own. Uh, so if you want to try out even tonight, right, you just read these two articles. One is like how to write Go code. This is like a pretty uh, basic overview of how the language works and how do you approach and how do you write your first hello world kind of code with Go. So go check it out. This one, uh, I'm not sure whether the URLs are visible, but just Google how to write Go code. This would be the first result. And then there's another document called Effective Go. This is a this, this is a web page, but it's pretty comprehensive. So it's not a book or anything, so it's, it may, may take like 40 minutes to read the whole thing. But once you're done with that, that's pretty much it. That's the whole language. That's all the concept of the language you have to know to write code. So next option is just to go open your favorite editor and start coding. So it's pretty easy to get started. And the fun starts from there. Right? Then you keep discovering new stuff and journey begins really early. So it's not like you had to read a whole book and uh, allocate like two, three weeks to just get started. It's just instant. You can do it tonight if you want. So let me go through like some of the interesting features in Go, which I personally like. It may depend on the person who's presenting, but these are like five, top five features, I guess, uh, which makes Go kind of special compared to other languages. So first option is Go format. So you know like if you're, if you're a programmer, you know that in your team, like everyone has their own coding convention. Like some have this idea like we should use spaces for indentation. And there's this another group saying, yeah, we should use tabs. And then even if they switch to spaces, then there would be like another wall, like we should be using two spaces. No, then there would be like, no, we should be using four spaces. So you will be actually fighting over these conventions rather than coding in most of the projects. At, uh, at least in most of these open source projects, that's what happens. Like, You spend like two, three months in mailing lists actually to figure out how do you set your format. So Go came up with a really smart solution saying, hey, you, don't, you should not fight over this stuff. We'll set the formatting for you. So Go has the built-in formatting tool, which like does the formatting. When you like click save on your editor, it will do the formatting for you. So, so if you enable this option, go format, it will format your code. So anyone who has this enabled will have the same formatting for their code. So if you go through like all the open source projects or even like internal projects, if they use go format, all the co code looks same. So yeah, so that's the beauty of it. Like so, it's not just your project. Uh, like uh, this, this problem is there like for like languages like Python, where you have this one format in your code. 
And when you look at some other project, it's like totally alien to you because it uses a different formatting for the variable names. They, some have the underscores or snake case, and some have this uh, convention of using camel case. So those it's its own format. So you cannot overwrite that. So you, you can, but then you're, you will be not considered as a pragmatic Go programmer. So just stick to Go format. And yeah, it can be easily hooked up to your editors. So if you're using like Sublime or Wim or something like that, it can run on your save. Like when you save the file, it will format your code. Or you can hook it onto your source code control, right? Say if you have a uh, source code control system like Git, you can say that when you do a Git push, it would do the formatting for you. So it's easily bookable for your environment. So that's one of the cool features. Next up is the standard library. So Go has this pretty cool standard library to get started. So most of the other languages, like say for example, like Node.js, when, when I was like coding Node.js, so I had to like always go up and look for the best package for this job, right? So I want to do some HTTP processing or like I want to connect to an API or something, then I had to look for API client, how to, how to do this work and I need to have a NPM package for this, and then I had to spend some time reading between different packages, which one is the best and which one is like actually maintained or not. So, Go saves all this hassle for you because it has a pretty comprehensive standard library to get started. Like for most of the common day to day jobs, like connecting to a HTTP API or doing the discovery or like writing to file, these kind of things are like pretty much well covered in the standard mm -hmm. library itself. Like Compared to other languages where they have the standard library, it's not really maintained well or something like that, but in Go it's pretty up to date. And it's also the go to source for the semantics and the idioms of the language. So you can actually refer to the Go standard library to see how they write the code and you can copy the same style to your code as well. So it's it's one of the key features and I this is like the first time I saw a language with a pretty comprehensive standard library because most of the languages has the standard library as an afterthought. Because when, once they figure out, they are, we'll just let the community to decide which package is the best. But after some time, they might bring in certain packages into the standard library. But instead of doing this, Go has built-in standard library, so to pretty much easy to get started. So, And also a good part of this is like, you have like really minimal external dependencies on your project. See, like, if you want to maintain a project for a couple of years, that's another problem you have, right? You depend on some external library, and that library is no longer maintained, and you have some issues down the line, like how to get, like a, if there's a security update, how do I get that, and like all these issues. But if you stick with the Go standard library, it's pretty easy because it all, it's always updated for you, and it's supposed to be well maintained. So that's another cool feature, the comprehensive standard library. And yeah, this is like the best part of the language. Like you can do like cross compilation. This means you can write code on your Mac or like in a Windows machine, and then you can expect this code to run on Windows or as you would see in our next demo, it can run on Raspberry Pis, stuff like that. So it can work on different architectures, different OSs, and it's pretty easy to build for this. You don't really need to go to Raspberry Pi and build that. You can actually build that on Mac itself. So all you need to provide is these build flags, and you can set the Go OS to a Linux, and then your architecture could be like ARM or something like that. So it's pretty easy to build for different architectures, and if you so, uh, if you want to build like multiple architectures for like so you have this one program and you want to distribute it to Windows, Mac, Linux, and different versions of like different CPU uh, models of Linux, and you can set all these and build like parallelly. Uh, this is possible. This can be done with this tool called Gox. So you can build for multiple architectures parallelly and just distribute, which is really cool. You just run on, like you write code on your own machine, and it, you can expect it to work anywhere. So because, and this is like, a, what you get is a binary, so you don't have any dependencies. You can just give the binary to your users, and they can just run it. So you compare this with other languages, like all these dynamic languages, like for Node.js, you need to have the Node.js environment installed on the user's machine. So if you want to give a program, you have to bind it with the Node.js runtime. So it's kind of an extra hassle. So Go doesn't have any of these. So you just output a binary, and your 
clients or your users can just run that binary and it just works. So next up is like uh, some like language level features. Uh, previous stream was like more high level stuff of the language, but these are like actual lang uh, programming features in the language itself. Uh, one is called interfaces. I guess uh, most of you are familiar with object oriented programming, right? So in object oriented programming, you will know there's this concept called classes. Like you have a class and you extend the class and you have these objects based on certain class. Like uh, in Go, there's no concept of classes. So it's kind of like there's this debate whether the Go is like an object oriented language or it's just a structural programming language. But it can be either of those. But the main point you should remember is like Go doesn't have classes. What it has is this thing called interfaces. So what is an interface? So interface is like pretty implicit definition. So if you can say like this, like if an object can do this, it can be used here. So when you write a function, this is actually useful when you're writing code. So you don't really know which object I'm going to use. So I write a function z. I want to, uh, I think, uh, I'll show you an example. I think it's easier to explain this way. So you write a taxi app or something, right? So you, so basic functionality would be like take a ride. So uh, you, when you write this function, you, you're not sure which taxi provider you're going to use. So you say any taxi should be able to drive me from A to B. Like if you, if a taxi can drive me from A to B, it's, it's okay. So I just want a taxi to drive from drive me from A to B. So you just define this, but you don't really know which exact taxi company you're going to use. So interfaces are like that. So you define what you want to do as a function. So if any, uh, any object that implements this function can be used here. So in case of here, like so you want to take a drive, so any any tax company here, like say for example, if Uber implements drive, so it can be used in your taxi ride. Or if Lyft implements this, you can use that. Or even your uncle implements drive, it's possible to use that as well. So as long as this object implements drive method, it's fine. It can be used as your object in this case of take ride. So yeah, so basically, uh, imagine this is like so you just define a function or like a method this is what I want to do and you forget about like which one implement this one so you just imagine yeah I have a concept of a taxi I don't really care about its implementation as long as it implements this specific method called drive it should be able to use in this scenario it can do like 101 other things but I don't care any of those stuff as long as it adheres to this interface it can be used so that's the cool thing. So you can define interfaces the way you want. So here in the top, you can see I have defined an interface called taxi, which needs to have the method called drive from one location to another. So a uh, funny part or like the smart thing about this is like you, you, you don't define it in the implementation the interface. So imagine like some other company comes in the future and they implement drive method they are automatically uh, usable in this taxi ride. So this is like, it's it's kind of uh, smart in that way, so you don't really have to know which one implements this method. And so some objects can implicitly adhere to an interface. So this is different from the class-based like, object-oriented structure where you have to say this object has to be extended from this particular class. But in this case, you don't say any, any of those things, but you just expect the object to have a drive method. If it has a drive method, it can be used here. So yeah, interfaces are, I think it takes some time to grasp this concept, but it's kind of new, even for me, like when I first started using interfaces, well, this is quite different from what we are used to from class-based inheritance or like, this is not really an inheritance in this case. So you just want an object to adhere to it certain kind of rules. As long as it follows these methods and implementation, it can be used here. So this is a really a cool feature of Go that you should be using. And this is one of the reasons you should use Go as well, because it reduces a lot of complexity in your code base, because you don't have to like define classes and subclasses and anything like that. 
So yeah, do check it out, like read more about interfaces. It might take some time to grasp the concept, but once you grasp the concept, it's really useful. Okay, next up is the concurrency. I said earlier, right, Go has built-in concurrency. So what does this mean? So in Go, concurrency is implemented using this concept called communicating sequential processes. This is a pretty early concept. This this was in theory from 1970s. There was this guy called uh, Hall, Hall, or yeah, H O R E or Hall, something like that. So he presented this paper in 1970s about this communicating sequential processes. This is basically a model how you can build systems with minimal coupling, but they can communicate with each other uh, in a sequential manner. So this is what it's called, communication sequential processes, and Go is like the first mainstream language to implement this. There are like experimental languages throughout the history, but Go is like the first language right up this concept. And it's quite powerful because if you know, like in languages like Java, you have this concept of threads. Go doesn't have any of those. So Go has something called Go routines. So when you want to do something concurrently, you just dispatch a Go routine, and you forget about that after that. So you say like, go do this. Basically, you prefix the function with a command called go. So you say go do this, and it will just do it. And how do you know if, if it has done the job? So it has to communicate back to the main process. So to do that, it uses something called channels. So it's like you send multiple workers, and they each one has like a cell phone, and then they call call you back and say, hey, I'm done with the job. So you wait till everyone finishes their job, or like you, you can define your logic how to proceed from that point, like whether I should wait like at least one person get back, or like whether I should work like all three people get back to me. So that's how you define the process. So the communication method is channels. So it's not like shared memory, or because earlier languages, like most of the conventional programming languages has the concept of like you write to some shared memory location and you then go and check that location whether it's written and like you keep pulling the location or it's how it's done but it's quite messy like when you try to implement it in that way. So channels is pretty much clear so it's pretty easy to model the concurrency pattern like it's like it's what you have in real in real life. So you have multiple people working on different stuff and they communicate with like some kind of a mechanism of a communicating channel. So let's go through a coding example to understand this better. Actually, this is not something to be used in actual programming language. Or you should not implement this in, if you want to implement a minimal method, you should not use this. So this I just found this yesterday. There was this coding challenge. Like it's like a Friday challenge, Friday pop quiz they call it. So this guy posted like one of the Go commute uh, core team members posted this example. So it had this line. So it, it basically wants a function which can get the minimum out of, like when you provide two values and you want to get the minimum of these two values. So he provided this line, first line, and this last line. And he asked the community to come up with a single line to go in between with these two lines, which can output the minimum value. So it was the challenge. And yeah, so there are like certain other ways to do it. And this one crazy guy, he broke all the rules. <laughs> so he, instead of using one line, he wrote at least like 10 lines of here, from here to here. So he went and used channels and go routines to find the minimum. So how it is done? So he implements a channel first. So this is the channel. And then he calls two go routines. So each go routine does is like it sleeps for some time. So so these are the two values, right? We, are, we want to find the minimum of these two values. And so that, there's these two go routines. They sleep for the given value. So first go routine sleeps for a, a number of seconds or milliseconds, and B sleeps for, B, uh, like this go routine sleeps for B number of milliseconds. So after like sleep is relaxed, it returns the value in the channel. So whatever the value that comes first, is the minimum value, right? <laughs> Do you get the idea? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Call back to so yeah, so it's pretty smart in a way, right? Because though it's not a single line, <laughs> but it's and also it shows how the 
channels and like go routines were well. it's a good example in that case, but never use this on your production systems. <laughs> okay. Right, so that's pretty much it. I guess that if you want to, if this was exciting enough for you, and if you want to learn more, we have a Singapore Gophers community. We have meetups every month. Uh, so do check out our Facebook page and the Twitter, uh, like Twitter channel. So it's golang.fg. Uh, golang so subscribe to those channels and the join for the meetups. And yeah, we have a like, pretty awesome community compared to like though it's like a very small and up and coming language, we have great enthusiasm in the community and people like Audrey then just like a lot of others who started using Go as their main programming language and has done amazing stuff with that. So do join and like I mean just go through that setup process. Do try it tonight and build awesome stuff and do come for the meetups from next month. Okay, so I'll hand over to Audrey to present some of the stuff she has done. Hi, thanks for coming today. Um, I, uh, as, as Lakshan mentioned, I am uh, new. I'm quite new to programming, uh, and I picked up Go in July uh, as my first uh, backend programming language. So I actually picked up programming um, in around April, uh, April May this year. So Go is uh, Go is actually really really new to me, um, and I, I I've been building uh, Go applications since July. Uh, I built a couple of apps. And I really enjoy uh, working with Go. Um, my first few applications um, are simple web applications. I built a CRUD app, a very simple, basic um, create, read, update, delete application. Uh, and then I also built a, um, an API client. Um, I think as a starter, I'll show you what I built for the API client. Um, this is my weather app. Uh, what it does is that it takes, um, it takes pictures from Flickr and, and um, and uh, weather data from from uh, weather API um, to to show you this. Okay, is internet working? Right. So this is what I built in Go. 
Um, what what it does is that it lets you look at pictures from like a, um, from random cities around the world, and uh, at the same time, it also shows you real time weather data. Uh, this is my this is my second uh, application that was built in Go. Um, subsequently, I, I I started using Go uh, to interface with hardware, uh, and I I um, built a, an application for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, in Go, oops. Go back. Um, okay. So the, the, the next app that I built um, is Go Snap. So what it does is that um, it it compiles a program that runs in the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it lets you call the uh, it it lets you control the Raspberry Pi um, uh, with uh, with your own application uh, on your on your uh, no <laughs> with uh, with your browser, I mean, uh, you can you can take the Raspberry Pi with the program running in a Raspberry Pi, uh, and then it will uh, it will take a snapshot from the Raspberry Pi and and show the image um, through your browser just by calling a URL from your browser. Uh, I wanted to show you today, but uh, because the the Wi-Fi is a bit shaky, so um, I can't do a live demo. Uh, this, um, so the README will explain what it does. Uh, allows you to take pictures from Raspberry Pi. Um, you can cross compile uh, the program uh, just by running um, by running this command um, to enable it to run on the Raspberry Pi. And uh, all all the instructions for running this program are on the README. So if you so you want, you can look at it. Um, yeah, so this is how you would call the um, Raspberry Pi to take a picture uh, by running this uh, URL in your browser. So this is my uh, this is, this was my my next project after the API client. Um, my fourth project um, is actually a, it's actually a new project, and I haven't I haven't talked about it, or I haven't released it officially yet. Um, but I'll just talk a little bit about it now. Um, it's called vSpark. Um, so v vSpark is a it's a program. Um, it's a Go program. Um, it lets you talk to the Spark Core. So the, the Spark Core is this uh, microcontroller uh, that is Wi-Fi enabled, um, and and uh, and with vSpark you can you can write Go programs uh, that that tell uh, the Spark Core what to do, <laughs> and um, so. So to, to enable this uh, to work, first uh, you have to load um, this firmware. It's called Voodoo Spark. Um, how okay, how you run it is um, you would you actually have a have, have an IDE um, with the code of uh, the Voodoo Spark code, and then you load it on onto your Spark, and uh, and uh, when it's running in the Spark, um, you would you would actually. Um, uh, make your commands through TCP, and uh, so so this is what you do. Um, install vSpark by running this command: go get GitHub. Um, this is an example program. Uh, what this does is is that it it um, instructs the Spark to blink, uh, and this is the code, the sample code for it. So. Um, this is the, the list of the APIs you can call uh, with your program. Um, you can do a lot of things with it. You can read uh, values. Um, uh, you can read values. You can write to it. Uh, yeah, and basically you, you can talk to the Spark core of this program. And yeah, that is <laughs> that is just a, a brief uh, overview of the the stuff that I've written. Um, yeah, that's that's all. So, um, any questions? Yeah, if you have any questions, you know, we can ask them. Since we have like some time left. Yeah, I would have um, demonstrated uh, something to you how 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 the program uh, would work, but but the Wi-Fi is down, so. Yeah. No questions.
So this is basically an API client which is written in Go already. Yeah. So yeah, so it's like this this thing I mean what you can understand from this is like you can talk to like different interfaces through Go. So it means that you can talk to T C P interface like since like actually the Spark code doesn't run like the Go code program but you it control runs C. yeah, it just yeah. runs a C program but still you if you if you're not comfortable with writing C code but you still have the interface to this, right? So you have all the pin interface, so you can control that through TCP. So that TCP program runs on Go, so you write that. So it's like a remote program to the actual like firmware running on smartphone. So it's kind of cool, like what you can do with this. Yeah, so a bunch of guys actually wrote this uh, Voodoo uh, program written in C, but it accepts um, it, um, um, TCP connections from any program written in any language. So actually a, a Node.js um, uh, library has been written for it. Um, uh, so, so this is this is the Go version of the library. Um, it's, it's actually like a remote Go package that you can download by running this command. So it's, it's like a package, it's so a anyone package. can build stuff on yes. Spark using this one. So um, if you want to look at the code, yeah, I suppose I can show you the code. So these are the these are the packages that I've imported from from the Go standard library. Um, so everything here is written in pure Go. So uh, you can see this function ping spark. Uh, what it does is that it it um, by running the command you you actually connect to the Spark core with TCP. Uh, this is the entire code for it, and then um, this, these are all the various uh, APIs that you can call by setting pin mode, uh, setting the pin, setting the mode, and uh, you can. This is the digital write function. If you're familiar with the Spark call, you 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 recognize these familiar commands. Yeah, analog write. Um, there there's a uh, um. The Voodoo Spark hasn't completely implemented all of the APIs for the Spark core. I think they're still working on it. So this is just a this is just more the, the more common uh, API calls that you can make to the Spark. Yeah. Also, so can you show the weather app as well? I think weather? it's interesting. Weather? The code or yeah, the yeah, code itself. Okay. Because mm -hmm. weather app doesn't use any like, Third party. Yeah. So right? yeah. So the weather app was written purely in Go, uh, with Go libraries, uh, without. Like the standard library itself, like yes. what I was mentioning yeah. earlier, because you don't really have to use like third party libraries to write code. Yeah. So uh, how how I've done it is that um, so I've created structs. Um, so you can see the imports in the top right. So if you scroll, you can, yeah, see like these are all the like standard library imports. So it's nothing like from the outside. Right? So if you import like an outside package, like, you could have a URL like GitHub slash something. Yeah. But these are all like like internal like standard library packages. So you can build stuff like what you showed earlier, purely using the standard library, which is I think kind of awesome. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Actually, in in Go, if you want to import a, if you want to import an external package, I can show you an example. Spark. So this is a sample um, that implements my package, the vSpark package. So what you do is that you have to you have to import the GitHub code from my GitHub, and all you have to do is just run go get uh, the git this this and this entire link github.com slash audrelim slash vSpark, and then it imports the code and it builds the it builds the package for you. So it's actually quite it's actually quite straightforward to to, um, to get external packages in Go. Um, yeah, that's that's for remote packages. So nobody has tried Go over here before. Yeah. So um, I mean, I, I I think I think the documentation is really good for Go. Um, yeah, unlike unlike some pro unlike some programming languages. Um, um, there's a very good, there's a very good um, place where you can learn Go. It's called Core Go, where you can, uh, it's where you can actually follow the instructions, practice, and run the 
run the, the code in your browser. So um, the documentation is also very comprehensive, uh, which I actually appreciate. So actually, actually, um, as as a, as a beginner, as a fairly new beginner, um, I appreciated that, <coughs> that everything was all collected in their official documentation. Um, this was re this was really helpful when I was practicing. So I think um, I think it, you know um, it, it was um, it, it, yeah it it seemed daunting to me at first, but I think. I think they have provided enough resources to, to pick up Go as a language, and uh, it's been it's been enjoyable to use Go so far. It's very clean. Uh, it's very it's, it, it's it's I find it a very straightforward, very very to the point, very no nonsense kind of language, um, and and I and I found that when I was cross referencing um other people's code, um I could follow what they were doing. So it so it was like oh okay uh, I like th th this is this is what th this is. Uh, what what they're using with I mean this is what they um, they're using Go to do, and um, yeah, and it, it's quite it's quite an easy language to read uh, once you get familiar with it. Um, yeah, as as Lakshan said, this like I I think you mentioned this is usually one one yeah go from like predictable one way of doing usually one way of doing things. Yeah, there's no way of yeah. like so like in other languages we have like multiple idioms right. So if we want to do something like if loop, or like yeah, like a for loop or something. Like there's like while or like there's multiple yeah, way yeah, of doing yeah, it, yeah. right? But in Go, it's, there's only one way. Yeah. Like, so in Go, like a, a continuous for loop is just for, for and then bracket. Yeah. Um, like, I yeah. Like they, I think they have kept the language syntax of very small. Uh, the the specs very small, um, but yet powerful enough to do many things with it. So once you pick up, once you pick up the the, the basics, it's very it's very. It's very um, fun to be able to, to, to think of ways, uh, <coughs> the, the many ways you can use all these different tools that Go has provided you. So you actually don't spend a lot of your time learning, um, you know, like uh, all, all this language syntax, but you, you, just learn, you just learn what you need and it's enough to, to get you building. So, I mean, with Go, you can build basic web apps, a build a crowd app, an API client. You can also interface it with uh, hardware. So it's it's nice as a language um, and also flexible. I think I think that's that's why I appreciate um, coding Go a lot. Uh, yeah. What about the debugging environment? I haven't I haven't got gotten that. Maybe Lakshan. Yeah. Maybe. So for Go, like uh, there's no uh, currently there's no like a default debugger. So there's another project called uh, there's a new project coming up. I forget the name, but it was in our group. So I can check it out later. Uh, so the way to debug Go programs is using GDB, as in C. Uh, if you want to do that, like it's kind of a hassle, like using GDB. So Go has this. Uh, th there's another concept in Go, like there's no exceptions. So every every time you have an error, you have to handle it. So the default way of doing this is like, so if you can like show some one of your codes, like you will see a lot of if error, or if error um. is not nil, uh, how to handle this. So. So each program, see even like HTTP uh. new request, right? It returns two values. One is like the actual request plus an error. Like in case if something fails, yeah. it, uh, the request would be nil, and then there would be an error. So you have to always check for the error. So you know, in the code itself, it has to be built. So you cannot just escape errors. So like in most of other languages, what you would do is like you just forget about the errors, and then you allow it to like throw up an exception, and then you go all to the stack trace and debug it. But in this case, like you have to like it is there, so you cannot escape from that. So you have to always think. So at the new request, you have to think how it can return an error. So what cases I should handle it. So if it if it returns an error, how I should handle it. So in this case, like we just like, make it fail, so the program itself just stops. So yeah. in some cases you can just proceed with the errors. You just log the error and proceed with that. So in the, if you if you follow this convention, like you save a lot of time with debugging. Yeah, actually, um, um, personally, I found that the, the error handling was very useful for me. Like, um, okay, first, I, I think I think before before you even come to error handling, the, the compiler is great Sorry. for checking errors. Um, uh, I think that's the first. Yeah, the first, first cut, step right? is like it it's just so like awesome. refuse to run your <laughs> yeah, code, right? So, <laughs> so I mean, when, when uh, there are different ways of running of compiling your code, right? Um, for go, go, go build, go install, whatever. So, so when you run go build to compile your program, um, if you 
if you have a type error, if you have anything wrong with your code, it will it will give you um, er an error message um, in that list. Um, it's actually it's actually really powerful because it, it tells you um, where exactly your your code, uh, why exactly your code is not compiling, where which line it is. Um, it will tell you, for example, yeah, so stuff um, like yeah. this. Say you like define a variable, but you never use it in the code. It will it won't compile in that case. Like so, in other languages, you yeah. can have like bunch of like random variables sitting around like doing nothing right mm -hmm. so you end up adding a lot of like shit in your code right? but in this case like you it won't just won't compile so you have to go and remove yeah. that and then come back and compile it so then like, like so if you when you're starting out right that that would be the annoying part right i i why cannot i just define a variable and get away or else if, if even for the errors like if you don't check the error like if you don't check the error, like it might just throw up and it's like it, it will not compile. Like it will say, yeah, there's an error. Like there's a multiple values returned, and you are not checking the second value, so it won't compile in that case. Like you know, you have to go back and oh shit, I have to write this. But it's kind of annoying when you get started. But once you figure this out, like you realize, yeah, because I'm doing this, I'm saving a lot of time down yeah. the line. Yeah. So actually, um, most of my most of the times when I had to uh, check my error was was at the compiling stage, and and it's so it's so awesome that, that it tells me where exactly the problem went wrong and I can debug it very quickly. Uh, once once I compile, um, if there are any errors, um, then it, it will print out the the error, the it will actually log the errors. Um, but usually, actually, usually I find that once I once I I debugged it in the compilation phase, I, I don't really have any problems in the in the later stage. So I think that's what I appreciate in Go a lot as well. It's kind of hard for people to mess around with the language. So because in other languages, like there's this expert mode and the beginners mode, right? Like for example, JavaScript has this JavaScript good parts and stuff like that. But the Go is like this the subset of the features is pretty minimal. Like it's it's all for everyone, whether you are a beginner or advanced. So everyone has to use the same like same language concepts so you cannot do anything beyond that so this helps a lot in the long run so the chances of people making mistakes or like like so if you cannot really tell like by looking at the code this is the awesome part right you cannot just look at someone's code and say maybe you can but at a first glance you cannot say whether it's like a beginner's code or like an expert's code or anything because all looks the same because everyone has to follow the same guideline so there's no way of like doing like smart stuff being like I'm smart I would do this shortcut method or something you cannot do stuff like that you cannot like show your smartness in the code because there's only <laughs> one way of doing this <laughs> so yeah. that's pretty awesome so so that's like the, the basic language level I think it's pretty solid for everyone to like get started and doing so this is why I feel like it's a great language So like, I don't mind if, if you don't mind. Like so, Audrey is like she's a lawyer, right? Yeah. <laughs> so she just switched to programming, and she was like, so she asked me like, which language to pick, and oh, yeah. <laughs> so I suggested her like go, yeah, just try using Go, and it's amazing how she built all these like apps within like yeah, couple yeah. of months period, right? Yeah, actually, I I I was I was actually considering a note. Um, I I I somehow didn't take to to the idea of building an app in Rails um, or in Python and Django. Um, but, uh, I think, okay, so another thing about Go is that it doesn't impose any frameworks on you. Or your, um, I, could build, I could build websites and actually uh, um, uh, many things just with Go code and as well as its Go standard library. So, um, I, I, yeah, I, I didn't, I, yeah, I, I, I didn't need frameworks. I, I didn't build any of this in frameworks, with frameworks. Just the gold standard library, which had, which, which really has a lot of things, um, pretty stable as well. Um, yeah. So, so that yeah. So, I, so I asked Lakshan if, if I should do no, and he's like, no. Why don't you do go? So, uh, so, so I started on go um, in July. It's been it's been about five five six months already, and um, it's enabled me to to build a lot of things with it, uh, because it's so straightforward, so clean, uh, and I. Yeah, so it allows like so to, you start with like crude web apps and then to go through like this whole extreme and you build up like hardware stuff, right? So it's yeah. like the, the spectrum is so <laughs> wide, right? So it's because the language principles are pretty much the same, so you can apply them like at any stage. So it's like 
you can if you're familiar with the language itself like you just it's like a nice hammer to like find whatever the nails you want and yeah like like knock them nicely so it works everywhere so that's i think this this, this is one of the best reasons to use this language Yeah, and in team, like we even at Nitrous, we found this right. So it saves a lot of time. In, in, like in terms of performance, it helps a lot. Like we had like huge performance gains by just switching to uh, go from Node.js. And apart from that, like we save a lot of time in terms of productivity within the team. So code reviews get much shorter and nicer because like there's no way to fuck up the code to be honest. So. If everyone like follows the same guideline, so once you like follow the same guideline, it's like nothing much to like yeah, review on the code. It's, yeah, it's all on the website. Like I think it's um, I think it's effective goals. Yeah, effective goals. Right? Or or also there's this goal spec. You can follow that too. So they have so they have all these things in the documentation. It tells you what to do. Um, it's actually quite a lot of stuff. Like how how are you supposed to write this? Um, whether a function should be camel or, or snake or whatever. Um, everything is here, so um, it, it doesn't it doesn't say like it's good it's good to have this or like you can have either this or this. It just tells you um, th this is this is what we want to, to see in, in your goal code. It should be like this. So yeah, everyone. I yeah, like so people see. complain like yeah. Sorry. Sorry, but when you say it helps you to format right, but I could still name the variable x y z. Sorry? I still still need variables yeah. XYZ, yeah. right? So yeah. it doesn't help doesn't like, formatting is like uh, so and like, spaces. So you cannot have like spaces, like you cannot have underscores within the uh, in yeah. Yeah, the variable names and then incantation, stuff like that. Right. And, yeah, and so you yeah. yeah, XYZ is fine, I mean it's fine within an average. <laughs> it's not readable at well. Yeah, but it's, it doesn't mean it's, it's not really like it depends on what, what you call readable, right? So right. actually in Go you it prefers to like there's another document I think it's called yeah. Go Code. Uh, oh, how to write Go code, code review? Code. Yeah, code yeah. review comments or something like that. It's an internal document in Google. So oh, it sh I yeah, yeah, Go Code review comments. So it says like variable should be like three letters or something. So you should not like have these long variable names. But it's kind of like mind blowing at the beginning why you like if you're coming from this other like dynamic language backgrounds like you used to have these very explicit variable names, right? With all like if like you say <coughs> do when this or something like that. So variable name is pretty much explicit. Then in Go it's like three letters. You just combine these three letters of like the three words and you assign it as a variable name. But once you fit uh, like this was like one of like my biggest gripes as well. And then I figured the scoping of the variable is pretty much important. So the variable scope is pretty limited. So that's what Go suggests. So you should not define a variable like. 100 lines above and then you sit like further down so it should be like you should be always like writing your code in like functions like smaller functions but this is like not really go like this is like general programming concept so keep your like structure minimal and if you have the way like the scope of the variable is limited then you can easily reference it so it's like it only applies within this scope so you know exactly what it does so stuff like that so yeah, like Go format helps in other cases where you have like different indentation and like how do you like run a like write a for loop. Like sometimes people have this like idea of like writing if in like one line and stuff. Right. So in Go, like you always have to have the braces. You cannot omit the braces and have like one line. It's not allowed. So yeah, like even sorry. Yeah. Even with that example, like yesterday's like this pop quiz thing, right? So people like try to like go and run, put a function in one line and but then it if you run with both format like function breaks into like five lines yeah. so you cannot omit that so yeah it's kind of tough I just to do like one line things i think we can do a demo like um on go go, go playground uh, where you can actually practice your code um there, there's actually an inbuilt go format so say you want to define a as a string <coughs> And then you and then you do some weird things like um, okay, so so I like this a lot because it, it, it can be lazy and and then all you have to do is run go format and then it, it does this pretty nicely for you. That's why um, a lot of the code that you a lot of other people's code that you all read right. is is actually very um, consistent. Yeah. Any other questions? Another five more minutes.
Where do you primarily use gold, like on nitrous? Is it so, on your web services? Yeah, so at nitrous, basically we start, so how we started with gold was like, we had this one process which is like, kind of like memory consuming and it's kind of a hassle to maintain, with, which was written in some other language. And then we were like, like comparing the options of like why we should like switch to something else. So we use Go, and we saw like huge performance gains just by switching this part. And then like so this is like so the way you, the way we have our application is like we have like multiple small services. So we like keep switching like each one to Go, and we saw like it helps the, like the whole process in, in like in the terms of performance and even the productivity of the team. So. Now, right now, we even power the front end, like the, even the one we had as the Rails app, it's now even powered with two. But most of it, it's on the back end. So. Yeah, so it's like, uh, so how it works is like your front end is like, uh, like say it's just a single page app, right? Yeah. So you use some kind of front end framework. And then you call like API endpoints to get the data through JSON or something. And then render it on the, like, in your front end, right? So these endpoints are also written in Go. So it's because it's kind of lightweight, so you can like split it out these services into their own process, and you can have it then as like sat one standalone app. Yeah, so it's so if you want, like you can go through the whole step from like like means it means like so it depends on the service, but can be the high like start with the high end ones like the ones that are like most like memory consuming or something, and then like just pick like, where you want to use. So check out the group and yeah, hope, hope you guys join for the future meetups and actually give a try on the language. Yeah, thanks, thanks for joining. Thanks. thanks.